podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, I got seven o'clock here. Um, this is meteorologist Bob Bright here at the National Weather Service in Charleston. I uh, wanted to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule tonight to join us. Um, looks like we have a pretty good group signed up, so hopefully uh, we will uh, have a lot to talk about tonight, have some good conversation. Um, we're obviously we're heading into the peak uh, of the hurricane season here, and uh, we wanted to take the opportunity to talk to you guys about um, the importance of being prepared. And um, we'll just wait a little bit longer, see if a few more people can join us, um, and then we'll jump right in. Bob, I'm trying to keep track of the chat as well. All right. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started here with some introductions. Again, um, I'm meteorologist Bob Bray. I am also the tropical program leader here at the office. Um, we also got Ron Morales joining us. Hopefully everybody can see the cameras. Um, Ron, if you want to say hi, um, raise your hand. Yeah, good evening, everyone. I'm Ron Morales over here at the, actually, I'm at my house, but I'm the warning coordination meteorologist here at the National Weather Service in Charleston. Yeah, and Ron is essentially our outreach coordinator. So he works with our, our all of our partners um, out there. So um, and we're also very excited to be joined by uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Neil Baxley, and um, Neil is the commander of the Beaufort County South Carolina Emergency Management Division. Uh, he certainly has his hands full there, and uh, I'm sure he's seen a lot of a lot of hazardous weather and other hazardous events that he's had to deal with since uh, he's been there. I think since 1983. Um, and is now command commander of the of the EMD. So um, we'll talk a little bit more um, about what he does and, and the partnership that we have with all of our emergency managers um, as we go along here tonight. So um, first, a few logistics. Um, hopefully, everybody can hear me well and, and see me and uh, no technical issues, but um, we're going to the way we're going to work things is um, we're going to have some questions, an opportunity for questions you can ask. Um, during the presentation, if you have any questions, just enter them in into the questions uh, portion of the go-to webinar control panel. Um, and then we'll try to leave some time at the end for some questions as well um, and get to, the, get to as many questions as we can in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, as far as the polls, we're going to have a few different poll questions that pop up along the way, try to make this a little bit more interactive. So uh, look out for those, and those will automatically pop up. As far as feedback, uh, you'll get a little survey afterwards, so we would appreciate uh, good or bad, any feedback that you may have for us. And then I uh, just wanted to note that the presentation uh, will be recorded. Um, hopefully all goes well with that. We, we can post that to our YouTube channel uh, after, this, uh, after this ends, probably within a few days. It might take a few days to get posted there. And also, um, if you notice in the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel, um, I posted a copy of the presentation so you don't have to take too many notes here. Uh, there's a copy of the presentation there um, as long as well as our uh, copy of our hurricane 
guide as well. So, of course, you can feel free. We'd encourage you to share those with with others um, that may be interested. So, um, so we'll jump right into the outline. We're going to talk a little bit about what we do here at the Weather Service, and then a little uh, history. It's always good to look back before we look ahead. Um, and then really the bulk of the presentation will be on the different tropical cyclone hazards, the forecasting, and then some preparedness information as well. And then how you can stay informed before, during, and even after um, the season. So a little bit about our office. Um, we are located uh, here in North Charleston at the, at the airport. Um, our office is open 24-7, uh, 365, so we are always around. Um, we have about 20 different employees, including meteorologists like myself, um, also electronics technicians. Um, they help run our equipment and the radar, which is down in Jasper County. We'll talk about that in a second, as well as the support staff. And really our main mission, uh, overriding miss mission is uh, provide weather, hydrologic, which is just water, and climate forecast and warnings for the U.S., uh, our territories and adjacent waters. And the main thing is for the protection of life and property and the enhancement of the national economy. So that's the, the main mission of the Weather Service. And uh, zooming into our local area, this is the area of responsibility that we that we have. Um, we have 20 different counties across Southeast South Carolina and Southeast Georgia. Uh, you can see by the star, um, our office there is in uh, North Charleston. Um, we also have responsibility for forecasts and warnings um, over the coastal waters of the Atlantic. So we, uh, we do marine forecasts as well. Um, our population keeps growing. <laughs> We're up to about 1.7 million now uh, plus. Um, a lot of people like this area and, and keep moving here. So uh, definitely more people and, and more infrastructure in harm's way that uh, presents you know, some challenges when it comes to forecasting and, and uh, preparedness. Um, our radar, like I mentioned before, is located down in Jasper County. So just inland from, from Beaufort there. Um, and it's it's important to know you know where you're located uh you know where you're going to get your watches warnings forecasts from so if you're in any of these areas that are highlighted these different counties you'll get your information from us or from our office but if you're just outside these areas to the north you know, you'd be getting your information from the wilmington north carolina office um, closer to the west there, toward the Midlands, you'll be getting your information from Columbia. And then back to the west, the Atlanta office, actually, they have a pretty large area. And they'll, they cover parts of interior Georgia. And then to the south, south of the Altamaha River, um, the information will be coming from Jacksonville, Florida office. So it's just important to remember um, where you're located and where your information is going to come from. So we really have a lot of different responsibilities. I won't go through all these, but I want to highlight our highest priority, which is the severe weather warnings. Uh, so that includes things like tornado, uh, flash flood, severe thunderstorm warnings. Um, that's really the, um, the bread and butter of what we do. And then um, second in line would be close second would be decision support services. So. Um, Really, that means um, working with our partners, our core partners like, like Neil and the other emergency managers, not only at the county level, but state level as well. And, um, you know, really just to brief them and, and uh, on that has any hazardous weather that, that might be occurring. Or even if there is an incident, uh, we provide weather support if they need it for that as well. So with that, um, I just wanted to to discuss a little bit about um, really to have Neil actually discuss a little bit about what he does there, um, the importance of our relationship, um, you know, between the emergency management community and our and our local office. Um, you can see from the pictures there, 
you know, some of these pictures from the big events, big hurricanes we've had, either getting briefings from the Hurricane Center or and or briefing um, our emergency management partners. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to Neil. Uh, Neil, can you hear me? Sir, can you hear me? Yes, sir. So, yeah, I'll just let you um, go over kind of what you do there and, and talk a little bit about how we work together. Yes, sir. Thank you for uh, having me tonight. I really appreciate the invitation, Bob. I have the uh, emergency management division commander here at the sheriff's office in Beaufort County, and I've held this position since uh, October of 2013. I've been with the sheriff's office 38 years, but my introduction to hurricanes in the low country was Hurricane David in 1979. I had been a recruit at Paris Island for eight days when David came ashore, and that was uh, quite, quite the experience being a recruit and dealing with a hurricane. Uh, but uh, since then, I've been through quite a few of them. And since becoming the Emergency Management Division Commander, it, uh, the relationship with your office is extremely important to our office. We, we reach out to y'all during all types of situations, whether it's uh, simply severe weather or, or tornado watches or whatever, to get up-to-date information. And it allows us to make really good informed decisions. I, I'll even call y'all if we've got a, a search going on for a missing person or something like that, or a major law enforcement incident going on, I'll call your office and get uh, spot forecasts so that we know what we're dealing with. Because while we have to continue doing the job, there are some uh, mitigating things that we can take to, uh, to protect our responders. But during a hurricane, it's extremely important. I'm sitting here in the Situation Room in our Emergency Operations Center, and if we were activated right now, this table would be uh, staffed by the members, the mayors of uh, each municipality in Beaufort County, as well as the chairman of county council, the county administrator and the sheriff. And those folks are responsible for making the decisions of how Beaufort County will meet, uh, address and respond to a, a hurricane threat. And we have to do that with the best information possible. So I would be on a conference call just like we are now and listening to you or Ron or one of the other forecasters giving, a, giving us really good real-time um, information that we, can, that we can bank on. And I will tell you that in the last few years, y'all's information has been spot on, and we've been able to make some really good decisions that made us, made us look pretty sharp, and we appreciate that. But the, uh, the relationship is, is very good. It's very close, and uh, I call on, on y'all regularly for information. All right, thanks. Appreciate that. And um, you know, as Neil said, it's it's just uh, it's a very you know important relationship that we have because we know we can reach out and anytime they can contact us and we can contact them, um, you know, and get that information, that critical information um, to help us, you know, do our fulfill our mission essentially. You know, and and like Neil said, pretty much the same mission that they have down there. The protection of life and, and property. So, um, so, so, what's the biggest storm uh, or most interesting storm you've had to deal with that down there? Any, uh, probably. Uh, well, I, I've been through Hugo, which was a near miss. Through Floyd, which was a near miss. Uh, Floyd was the first time we did a full scale evacuation of the recruits at Paris Island, which is a, an incredible undertaking. Um, Matthew, obviously, which has been the most impactful to Beaufort County and uh, probably, I guess, since Gracie in 59. And so having to go through that as division commander, we deployed all of our resources. We did, uh, we deployed all facets of the plan. We set up pods afterwards for food and, and water distribution because we had a fair number of people impacted by it and large scale power outages. We enacted our reentry plan, which worked as, as it was supposed to. Uh, an awful lot of things that, uh, while we did not have the catastrophic damage that our friends to the South have had during Katrina or Michael or, or most recently Ida, it allowed us to experience it and find our problems in our plan, correct those problems and be ready for where when the next big event does come. So, Matthew probably had the most effect on us, although we went through Floyd and Hugo uh, as kind of a learning experience. Yeah, and I, I think you'd agree that, you know, it takes some storms, different experiences to kind of build up. And you kind of notice how, 
you know, you learn from each subsequent storm and, and, you know, but yet they're all unique in some different way. So it definitely presents some challenges from a, from a forecast aspect and, and a response aspect. So, um, yeah, hopefully we don't have any, any more anytime soon, but, um, you know, time, time is just, um, time is short and, uh, I'm sure eventually we will. So. All right, so now we're going to jump into a little bit of history. We talked a little bit about uh, the uh, history there with, with Neil, um, but we're going to jump right into that right now. But before, as we do here, I wanted to um, open up this poll question um, and see, you know, for those that are on the line, um, it should be popping up on your screen here, and we'll give it a, a few seconds. Um, hopefully you can see that. But the question is, have you ever experienced a tropical cyclone? And that, by that we mean tropical depression, tropical storm, uh, or hurricane. So it'll be interesting to see, for those on the line, what the level of experience is. Keep it open for a few more seconds here. And we'll try to share the results. All right, so it looks like everybody that, that answered has experienced a, a storm. So that is interesting. Um, I think, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about the different hazards and such as we go, but uh, like I mentioned with Neil, um, I think you'd probably all agree that, you know, every storm is unique and different. And so again, um, one of the points we would like to get across today is, is how you really have to take that into account, um, take that personal experience, but remember every storm is, is different and, uh, you know, deserves unique attention. So, so we'll jump right in now. We're going to talk a little bit about tropical cyclone, uh, season. And really when we talk about the hurricane season, um, we are talking about, uh, for the Atlantic Basin, which includes the Atlantic, uh, the Caribbean Sea, and the Gulf of Mexico. It's officially uh, June through November, but it's important to remember that we, we can get storms outside of that period too. And um, the graph at the bottom shows that uh, based on a study we did a few years ago up through 2018, and you can see by month uh, the different the number of different storms that have impacted the area. And um, what really jumps out is, is how most of the storms are in that peak of that hurricane season. Um, September being the peak, but also August and October. And you can see some of the storms there, um, you know, that have occurred during that period. And there's are really some of our bigger, stronger uh, storms. And that's really, um, that goes along with the Atlantic Basin as a whole. Is, is that's typically when we do see those stronger, stronger storms. But it's also interesting to point out how um, we can definitely see some impactful storms even before uh, August. Um, like in July, we had a couple different hurricanes: uh, of Bob in 1985, Cindy in '59. Of course, later that year we had Gracie. Um, hey, Bob, we're still seeing the poll. This is Ron. Oh, you're seeing the poll still? Okay. Yeah, we're not seeing your slide. There you go. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so here's the uh, graph. Sorry about that. Um, so you can see, you know, even before the peak of the season, August to October, we, we do see um, quite a bit of storms, even in June and July. 
Um, even some in May and some of those like Bonnie still produce quite significant impact. So um, just keep in mind that um, even before uh, the peak of the season, which we're in now, we can still see some pretty impactful storms. All right, so uh, a little bit more about history, uh, local history. Uh, it, from the time that official hurricane records have been kept from way back to 1851, we've had 42 tropical cyclones uh, make landfall uh, in our area of responsibility. And again, that's from Charleston County, um, south or through McIntosh County in Georgia. And that includes seven tropical depressions, 10 tropical storms, and then 25 hurricanes, and um, five of those were major hurricanes. And you can see those lifted there uh, way back to 1854, the Great Carolina Hurricane, uh, the Great Sea Islands Hurricane in 1893, which is the, the deadliest hurricane in our uh, neck of the woods, killed, unfortunately. Uh, we don't know the exact numbers, but 1,000 to maybe 2,000 people. Um, and then 1893, later that year, we also had a major hurricane hit as well. That was a pretty, pretty destructive year. And then it was a while since we saw a major hurricane landfall, uh, not until Gracie in 59. And then 30 years later, we had Hugo in 89, which was the strongest and the costliest storm. So now we're going to jump into the hazards and... For this part, um, I believe Ron is going to take take over from here. Um, so, Ron, you you got it. Yep. All right. Thanks, Bob. And I'll, I'll I want to apologize if you hear a barking dog. He doesn't want to leave me. He's sleeping right next to me. So hopefully, he stays sleeping. Well, by the looks of the poll, it looks like we might be preaching to the choir tonight with a hundred percent people that at least answered the poll saying they've experienced some sort of tropical system. So most, if not all of these hazards that we're going to review here this evening are, are probably not a surprise with the exception of possibly rip currents, which most people probably don't think about, but they're actually around outside of hurricane season as well. So we'll go over the standard storm surge, tornadoes, high winds, of course, uh, flooding rain, and also uh, we'll talk about rip currents. Next slide. Yeah, I'm not seeing the next slide, Bob. Oh, one second. Still missing? Yeah. Uh, Are you seeing it? There you go. Now I see the poll question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, uh... So I guess out of the out of those hazards, which one do you think is the most deadly, historically anyway? Which one do you think out of those strong winds, storm surge, heavy rainfall, flooding, tornadoes, and even rip currents, which one's the most deadly during a tropical system? Okay. Now can you see the poll? Yep, I see, yep, I see the poll. And I uh, cannot see chats from people that are attending because I'm a panelist. Okay. So I won't be able to follow those for you. All right, looks like a few more seconds. Looks like we got most people. All right, let's see if you can see the results here. I would actually say that's pretty good. 
So yep. looks like most people hit the uh, rainfall, flooding, and storm surge. So if you combine both of those together as just some sort of flooding, you are right on the money. That is historically now been the deadliest aspect of a tropical cyclone. And, you know, if you sit down and think, well, why is that? You know, why aren't people dying of storm surge? You know, you think back of the 1900 Galveston hurricane where anywhere from six to 8,000 people died because, you know, they were right in harm's way when that water came ashore. Well, what do we do nowadays? As Neil talked a little bit about earlier, we evacuate. So we evacuate the coast and we run from the water and we hide from the wind is the old adage. So in this country, it's pretty difficult to die from storm surge. Now, heavy rainfall flooding, is it a difficult uh, thing to, to run from because it can happen everywhere? Go ahead, Bob, advance it. So we talked about flooding. You know, that's what you should be thinking about, especially when, when a tropical cyclone is coming toward your area. You can just advance through these, Bob. Um, we have actually more deaths from the water, and it's not the wind. Even though you would think, you know, wind is horrible, but you can pretty much protect yourself from that if you're in a a reasonably well-built structure out of the storm surge zone and uh, you're hunkering down and protecting yourself. And we always tell people, turn around, don't drown. It's, it's generally vehicular type uh, problems that, that are occurring with these flooded waters where people are just driving into this water even after the storm and they don't know how deep it is and they end up getting in trouble or worse, you know, getting injured or even dying. And Roads are going to wash out. All kinds of issues are going to occur. Go ahead. Now, the after the storm effects is quite deadly. In this uh, particular bullet here, it mentions generators, power equipment, that type of thing. That's the carbon monoxide poisoning, if you will. And that's an issue in the winter as well. If people are running generators and it's inside their home or a garage and it's, vent it's not venting outside, also not listed here, things like chainsaws, big problem. People are running outside to cut up trees and limbs. A lot of times it's the first time they've used a chainsaw or they haven't used one in a long, long time, particularly dangerous and even deadly. So you can see that the deaths here are and injuries from even after the storm are, are a big problem. And this is true even for things like ice storms, you know, winter storms, other, other storms as well, not just tropical. Go ahead. So a little bit of terminology, and this I fear is still not really understood well by a lot of people. And I and I you are in good company if you don't understand it because it is a little bit complicated. And also, even some meteorologists don't fully understand it. But I'm going to try to break it down to a very because it's really can be broken down into a simple form here. That if you look at the graphic below, and you just think of your normal tide, and that's the orangish line where it says two feet so that's like say two feet above mean sea level that's just some value that we use which of course means sea level is changing because the height of the overall ocean surface is changing so sea level is going to what what is an average sea level or mean sea level is going to have to be recalculated at some point here soon but let's say you have a tide and then the wind is blowing on top of the water from the storm in this case a hurricane and, and if you think of just pushing your hand across the water, like when you're in a swimming pool, that your hand would be the wind and it's just pushing all that extra water. When you're out in the middle of the pool, it doesn't make a big deal, it just makes some waves. But if you were, if your pool were shallower at one end, you would see that water rushing up into the shallow area because it has nowhere to go. That extra water by the push of the wind, that's the storm surge. Now you've heard that word a lot, and it's interchangeably used for another term, which is actually water above ground that I'll get to in a minute. But storm surge in its basic sense is just extra water created by the storm above the tide. So if you take the tide and you add the surge, you get something called storm tide, which you don't really hear too much about. And then uh, and those storm tides can be in different datums like mean sea level, mean lower low water, above ground level, or AGL. But what we're really looking for is the inundation. Now, that's kind of a funky word. We thought people would understand 
and it's turning out to be a little bit not very straightforward for a lot of people, but it's simply water above normally dry ground. So on that graphic there where that house is, the water looks like it's like halfway up the door approaching the windows there. That would be the inundation, and that might be two, three, four, five feet of water above the normally dry ground there. And that's what we're looking for because where it's normally dry might be where you live or where roads are, and that's going to cause problems. And you notice there's a, a picture of a wave on top of that storm tide, which we really don't account for in our products. And waves can be particularly, not only can they make the water level higher, but the battering effect of waves as they hit structures over and over again are very, very destructive. Okay. So this graphic here is trying to, trying to show how vulnerable the low country is, our entire coastline, you know, from the Charleston County coast all the way down to the McIntosh County coast in Southeast Georgia. The red area, that's how far all of that would be inundation or water above ground from storm surge. Now, in a particular storm, you're not gonna get the entire coastline flooding necessarily. This is just a depiction, kind of the worst case, as if a, a Cat 5 hit everywhere along the coast. That's how far inland the water could go at any one particular location. So we are extremely vulnerable to storm surge and the effects that they, they penetrate far inland, 20, 30 miles or more in some cases inland, well away from the coast. So just because you don't live right at the beach doesn't mean that you are not susceptible to storm surge. So this goes uh, many miles inland. Uh, next slide there, or next bullet. So we already talked about um, they are, it's not every location that the forecasts are available for. It's, it's kind of areas. And what you want to do now is look at this graphic, and if you can make it out here, like, do you live in these areas that are colored in red? Because that would be the farthest extent, uh, reasonable anyway, of, of water that can go inland. And would you be in an evacuation zone? Would you have to leave if asked to? So you need to know that, and I would guess that most of you on the phone already do, and listen to those local officials. When they tell you to evacuate, do so, because they're doing that to save your life. Now, a lot of times we, we can't know exactly where the worst storm surge is because it's very complicated to figure that out, and you have to have a perfect forecast for the track and intensity of the storm. So there's going to be a slop. There's going to be an error, if you will. So you might have evacuated and come back and said, hey, my house, I didn't have any storm surge. You know, that's great, that's great, um, but you might, or you very likely will, or somewhere in and around the area that you live in. So we can't take that chance, since if you were caught in any of that, you could be killed and certainly have major damage to your property. It's very easy. I, I found quite a few videos, just raw videos, shot by folks that were in Ida a few weeks ago, and it was frightening to watch. People were shooting video in areas where they were in storm surge zones, they should have been evacuated, and the water was you know, up to their house, and they were experiencing 150 plus mile per hour winds. Those people should have not been in those homes. You do not wanna be caught in that situation. And, uh, we, and just to reiterate, we do not, at the National Weather Service, we do not uh, do the evacuations. We provide the weather information that goes into that decision. And for South Carolina, ultimately the governor makes that decision. And in Georgia, it's a combination. It's largely put in the hands of the local emergency managers and city officials or county officials. So we talked about flooding being deadly. It is the, has been the most deadly over the last few decades, especially inland flooding. This is actually I-95 from Tropical Storm Bonnie back in 2016 produce significant flooding. I don't know if you can make that out, but those cars are buried, you know, up above their doors and into the windows of water on a major interstate highway. Weaker, slower moving storms, you know, don't let that, don't let that fool you. Those are, they can be very prolific rainfall makers producing, ex, you know, very heavy rainfall. For example, Harvey was a category four a few years ago when it hit further south in Southeast Texas. But by the time it went up into the Houston area, it was just a depression 
a weak tropical storm at the most, but it sat there forever and it produced, you know, 40 to 60 inches of rain, just catastrophic amounts of rain. Next bullet. Um, so we talked about making sure you know you live in a flood zone. If you do, you know, be prepared to leave or evacuate. Don't drive through the waters if you can help it. And this goes for not just tropical systems. Just takes about a foot of water of, uh, with some sort of current to start moving your vehicle or lifting it off the ground. And don't think, well, I've got a big SUV, I'm safe. They just float better. So, you know, they might sit up higher and make might make you take risks that you shouldn't otherwise take. So, you know, don't get complacent just because you have a big truck or an SUV. Next slide, Bob. All right, high winds. This is probably what comes to a lot of people's minds when they think about tropical systems. I know it comes to my mind because it's one of the first things I think about protecting my home from. And I've been along the coast for 30 years, from Texas to Florida to up here in South Carolina. And uh, one of the things I worry about is the wind. And then if I'm close enough to the coast, which I am now, storm surge can be a problem as well. But it's the peak wind, you know, that's, it's, it's like, it's not just the peak wind, but how long they occur and what direction they occur in. And one thing you might want to know for your house is if you really want to get clever and you are low on time to protect your home, you might want to know what the direction of the strongest winds might be from and at least try to protect that side of your home first with boards or, or paneling or whatever you might have to cover your windows. Uh, think about the wet soils. We've had a pretty wet stretch in the last few days. You know, if we were to get a tropical system right now, the ground's pretty wet. Wouldn't take much wind to uproot a tree in particular. And uh, we do do extreme wind warnings. So that's a special product that if we think they're going to be cat category three, which is 111 miles per hour or higher winds, we will put out what's called an extreme wind warning, which is very similar. Actually, we used to use the tornado warning for this, but now we have a, a, a separate product. Uh, if you get one of those, you're in big trouble for high winds. You want to hunker down and get into a safe place immediately if you are not already. But probably you are already since you're getting into the eye wall or the strongest part of the storm. The uh, Being in the uh, high rise buildings can be particularly problematic. You know, the winds are going to be uh, stronger, a little bit above the surface as they get away from the surface friction, like trees and, and, and cars and that kind of thing. So when you're in a building of say several floors up, especially let's say 10 to 20 floors up, if you're in a really high one, you're really in some strong winds up there. So be aware of that, that uh, you probably don't want, want to stay up in one of those buildings, especially exposed near the coast. And then we know, or maybe you know, that winds can penetrate way inland. Hugo, you know, had hurricane force wind gusts well inland, all the way into Charlotte. You know, that takes what, almost three hours to drive from Charleston to Charlotte, it's a long way away. So, you know, that can go well inland. And that really depends on how strong the storm is at landfall and how quickly it's moving inland. If it's moving quickly and very strong, it doesn't have, you know, it's going to weaken in a relative sense a little less by the time it moves in because it doesn't have a chance to feel the ground, if you will, underneath, because it's skipping over it so quickly. So don't think that, well, I live 20 or 30 miles inland, I'm not going to have wind damage. For those of you that were around here for Hugo, you know that that is not right. One of the things that probably a lot of people don't think about, and frankly, in a stronger storm, are, in my mind, a bit lower on the priority list, because if you're in a major hurricane, and you're already getting, you know, 120 mile per hour winds, uh, getting one of these weaker, usually they're weaker, EF0, which is like 60, 65 miles an hour, up to EF1, you know, around 110, which is pretty impressive. Uh, these tornadoes can be embedded within the strong uh, rain bands of the storm, but more likely they're an issue away from the storm, uh, even in a tropical storm, and the thing could be 100, or more miles away and outside of any rain bands, it's actually not that bad outside. And then a rain band comes in, it gets squally and they could have some of these little tornadoes in there. So be aware of that and uh, be aware of that, especially if you're preparing and you're doing some last minute preparation 
and these outer rain bands are getting toward you and you know they could impact that or impact evacuations as well. And if you do, uh, if we do issue a warning, so you're going to get a tornado warning for one of these. You know, you want to again, again, get into that safe place, similar to what I spoke about with the extreme wind warning, with the category plus, uh, category three plus winds. Same idea. You know, this is a uh, significant winds. You know, on top of you're sort of adding insult to injury if you're already in very strong winds and you're getting a tornado warning. You might, you might not even notice it. It, it, it depends. All right, this, this particular hazard is not something that we focus a whole lot on during a hurricane because in general, if one's coming up here, we hope that people aren't on the beach. But ahead of a system, a lot of times surfers go out and they uh, are taking advantage of the large waves, uh, big swell, and actually surfers use rip currents to pull them, so if you see this, this picture here with the, the green dye there, and that is pulling it from the shore outward. So if you're a surfer, you would get on your board and get on that, and it, like that little river would take you out so that you don't have to paddle. But if you're a swimmer, and worse, you're not aware that that's there, that's gonna be pulling you out, and you're gonna try to be swimming backwards toward the coast. Very dangerous, very tiring. A lot of people don't make it when they're caught in one of these. So what you want to do is swim parallel to the coast to get out of that current, then swim on in. And we do issue rip current forecasts daily through the season, through the surf, what we call the surf zone season, which you know runs through the warm season when people are on the beaches. So you know, be aware of that. If you are out on the beach for some reason, ahead of a storm or on the periphery of a storm that's way out to sea, that's where it's dangerous. You know, be aware of these rip currents anytime you go to the beach, actually. All right, the next uh, topic here is the forecasting aspect of, of the tropical program. And it's a, little bit, it's a little bit involved. We have kind of two things here. We've got a center, the National Hurricane Center, which is part of us, the National Weather Service. But think of them as kind of like an international airport where they're dealing with big areas, the whole country, actually the Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico and Atlantic, and even the East Pacific, they deal with for their area of response and, re, and, and for service. So they're issuing the kind of big picture thing. They're putting out the track and intensity forecast, but their products really end at the coastline. A lot of people don't know that. So when those hurricane warnings go up, for example, they're really only valid from the hurricane center one, they're only valid right for the coastline when those watches and warnings go up. At the local level, which I believe is the next bullet, the um, the that's our office and other offices like ours that are going to now take that and decide whether a hurricane warning in this case or a tropical storm warning or a watch is needed in more inland counties away from the coast so we have to coordinate that we talk to the national hurricane center we coordinate with our partners you know and we get those local products out and we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of those local products so if you go to hurricanes.gov you go to the national hurricane center weather.gov um, if you forget our, our station where we are, if you just go to weather.gov and click on the map where you are interested or where you live, it'll go to the proper weather service office that covers that. Uh, so you can, you can get all that information right off of the web. And we do coordinate with all of our partners uh, constantly throughout a tropical system, particularly emergency management and the media. Here are, here's a kind of a, a little bit of a, of a collage of products that are issued by the National Hurricane Center. So these are national big picture products, starting from the top left there, that's the tropical cyclone or uh, outlook. And that used to just be two days, 48 hours, it now goes out five days. So you can get an idea of what's coming, you know, what's out there now and what is potentially going to form in the next uh, zero to five days. The bottom or kind of middle center graphic there, which you may or may not be, well, I, I think most of you are probably familiar with it or at least seen it. That's the so-called cone graphic or forecast cone. Uh, the biggest thing I wanna have you take away here is that cone is not, it is not an impact area. So if you're in or outside that cone, that does not mean that 
uh, where you're going to be impacted. All that is is the uncertainty or error in the track of the forecast. That's it. So um, be be aware of that when you're using that. The top left graphic that's on their products that go out their public products. That's a couple three four years old now where they have what's called key messages, and that's a good kind of high level. You know what are they worried about? Storm surge, rainfall, flooding. You know what are what are some of the big picture stuff that the National Hurricane Center is worried about? And the last graphic there, the bottom right, is relatively new, and that is the arrival time of tropical storm force winds. Now, we have different ones. We have earliest reasonable arrival time, and then we have um, most likely, but the earliest reasonable is kind of a, a good one to prepare off of. It's probably a bit aggressive, uh, or maybe too early when it's when it's um, predicting when the tropical storm force winds would occur in your area, but that's good for for preparedness because you want to be ahead of the curve. Next slide. All right, this is probably the only real technical graphic that we have on here, but it's one of the only ways to show you that despite what you might think or have seen or have heard or read about. The forecast errors for the track, that means where is the storm going to be, where is it going to hit, have improved dramatically, over 70% since 1970. So if you look at, say, the average three-day forecast in 1970, uh, that would be the, uh, the orange line. I don't know if you can make that out. But, um, you know, that was out somewhere around 450 nautical mile error, meaning you know, that's the error. That's a lot, right? Now, about 100 nautical miles in 2019. So a pretty good reduction. I don't think we're ever going to be perfect, but that's pretty darn good. Next graph. This one is the intensity, meaning how strong is the storm going to be? Very difficult. Okay, we still don't have great guidance on this. And you can see that the curves are less steep. They're not declining as much, which means the, the improvement, there's some improvement, but it's not nearly as much as the improvement has been for the wind. So we're working very heavily, very hard on that as an agency in the last uh, several years. Been a lot of money put on tropical cyclone intensity forecasting and improving that. And I think we've made some strides. I mean, look at look at Ida just a, a few weeks ago. And uh, Michael, prior to that, these what's called rapid, rapid intensifying storms, which are extremely dangerous because they generally seem to do it, especially if they do it near the coastline. Or near where they're going to hit, they did a pretty good job on that. It was a you know a tropical storm when it was hitting Cuba or you know nothing big, and then once it got into the Gulf of Mexico, we knew it was going to intensify, and it at least had forecasted it to be a major hurricane, which indeed it was. It was a strong Category Four. So, when you're looking at our stuff from the National Hurricane Center in our office, uh, feel confident that it it's of good quality and that you can make good decisions off of it. Here is a graphic that you may or may not have used that you might have to dig a little bit to find on the Hurricane Center site, but it is available once there's a hurricane watch or warning out. This is the storm surge inundation graphic. It's the potential. So it's kind of the worst, what we call the reasonable worst case scenario. So if you're looking at this graphic, it gives the impression that it's super detailed and it does have good detail on there, but it's kind of taking a, a probabilistic approach. So if we we kind of run a thousand different tracks here and, and differences of how the storm is, is in intensity and its speed and its exact location and all that. And we come up with a probability that the storm surge will be a certain value at a certain location. So this is a great way to prepare yourself, to prepare, prepare for an evacuation, to prepare for your home and your property. So this is inundation. So this is water above normally dry ground. So in this case, where those yellows are, that's greater than three feet. That's usually the trigger for a tropical, uh, excuse me, a storm surge watch and or warning. If we think it's greater, it's gonna be greater than three feet above the ground. We also issue storm surge watches and warnings, which were not issued as of a few years ago. They were, there was no such, there was no such product. They were all kind of, it was just in the text of the products. We now have the ability to issue watches and warnings for very particular areas that can be quite detailed 
and they can be outside of a hurricane watch or warning or that part is just for the wind. That's because the storm surge does not have to always line up exactly where the strongest winds are. You can have three or, uh, or more feet of water above ground well away from the storm center in a big, strong storm. So be, be aware of that. All right, this graphic, what I want you to focus on is the two left, uh, the leftmost one and the middle one. So the left one is the kind of observed or actual storm surge that occurred with Hugo. And what I want you to see is if you move to the middle slide, the colors show kind of the difference of what happened here. And in the orange areas, for example, you can see that uh, there was a, a six to almost 10 foot difference higher in water. If the storm didn't make landfall up in Mount Pleasant or in the Onda area, but for a little bit further south, not much more, 20 miles or so over Kiowa, here's what the difference would have been. And just the easiest part to focus on is the peninsula. And you can see that the peninsula is now completely, has all of it has some sort of water on it versus in the reality where the storm hit north of there, there were dry spots kind of in the center and in the northern part of the peninsula. So a little variation in the track a little variation in the strength can cause a big variation on where the maximum storm surge occurs and how much of it is going to occur. So that's why that previous graphic, we use a probability. Uh, here's a great way, and this is issued by our local office called the Threat and Impacts Graphic. And we have them for all of the hazards, wind, storm surge, rain, and tornadoes. And this is a way to kind of ball up all the uncertainty and all the background information to say, hey, here is what you should be worried about for the threats, meaning like the wind, how strong is it gonna be, but more importantly, what do we think it's going to do to you? And each one of those colors represent a different layer or level of impact. So this is a way, kind of a good one-stop shop to go to. We also issue something called a hurricane local statement, which is a text, product and it's really kind of a large overview a 30,000 foot overview of in our case the worst hazards the highest impacts across our entire area so it is not going to be detailed it's kind of like just a, a summary of the worst impacts over the area and then we have another product that actually both on the national level and local level we issue our local watches and warnings and it's through a product called a TCV not something easily read it's by the eye, it's mostly meant to be parsed out by computers to parse out all the watches and warnings that are, that are in there. It's county-based and has all the hazards and their potentials in each one of those sections. And then after the storm, which probably nobody on the phone or on the call knows about is the post-storm report, which we have to produce every time we have watches and warnings in our area from a tropical system. And that is the peak way, uh, rain, winds, and storm surge, and all the impacts that occurred across our area. We produce a report that can be read by the general public, can also be read by the media, academia, but most importantly, the Hurricane Center. And if I were there in person, I would be stopping and seeing if you're asleep or and if you have questions. Since I can't do that, we're going to do the questions at the end. So, um, I'll move into the preparedness section here. And I think most of this is, is probably pretty straightforward, but we're gonna start with a quick question here. Which of these are hurricane preparedness myths? Which are myths? All right, hopefully y'all can see that. And hopefully you're still, still alive and awake. We got some answers coming in here. So which one of these do you think are myths? All right, and uh, I noticed that it looks like you can only select one at this point, which is uh, which is not 
correct the way it was set up, so we apologize for that, but we will... Unless you just, just think it's one, but in reality, it's it's multiple. So here's, let me close that, and hopefully you can see the results. So at least we can see what most people chose. One of the biggest, one of the biggest myths, I think most people selected uh, the myth that you don't have to prepare just because you're inland. Very good. So I think Ron did a good job talking about the different hazards and how they're not just at the coast. So, um, but in reality, um, all of these could have been selected because they're all hurricane myths. So good job, no matter which one you you uh, chose. All right, Ron. Okay, so this section is, you know, it's never ending with the amount of preparedness information that's out there nowadays with social media and the web. But a good place to start if you're lost, I guess, is to go to our tropical page, which is listed up there, weather.gov forward slash CHS tropical and tropical guide, which Bob has, I believe, linked as one of the handouts. It's a it's a pretty long guide, but it's very extensive and comprehensive of things you can do to prepare for, for a storm. And it can be overwhelming, especially if you haven't thought about it. If you go to our, our page, weather.gov CHS, and scroll down a little bit and click on the little hurricane symbol, and then go to the preparedness tab, you'll get a whole host of preparedness, very good preparedness information, brochures, videos, short videos that are generally less than three minutes long. So they're great to get a quick snippet, especially if uh, even, even having your children, uh, younger people watch them as well. And of course, uh, check out your state and county emergency management office web pages. They're usually far more extensive with preparedness information than we are. And, you know, going to the uh, South Carolina EMD, which is scemd.org. And if you're down in Georgia, g uh, g e m a g e m a .georgia gov, I'll have extensively um, uh, more comprehensive lists of things for preparedness. So we're just going to run through just a couple of quick snippets here of things that you can do. You know, determine your risk. You know, is storm surge and inland flooding a problem? About strong winds, exposure, you know, are you new to here? If you if you just moved here, you might not know any of these. You need to ascertain that as quickly as possible so that you know what you might be up against. Storm surge is not going to be for everyone. If you're way, way inland, you know, storm surge might not be your issue, your issue but strong winds and certainly inland flooding uh, and tornadoes could be a problem for everybody. Next slide. So for what about if you are closer to the coast, are you in an evacuation zone? And if so, how are you going to get out? Are you going to get out? Are you saying that, no, I'm not going to get out. I'm staying, you know, for whatever reason, which we highly uh, don't recommend you do that. But um, everyone has different circumstances and uh, maybe it's not easy for you to get out, but Obviously, if you can and you can do that early, get out. And don't forget about your pets as well. And that actually holds a lot of people up from leaving. You don't want to wait and go to an evacuation shelter because those are usually much more restrictive than if you go to, say, a hotel or a friend's house or a family, you know, whatever. So, and, and look at the routes, especially if you're new to here. Don't take the main roads. Try to take, you know, the, the, the roads that aren't, you know, as well-traveled and maybe less likely to be jammed up. Next slide. This is a tough one. I'll admit that even this one wraps me up a bit every year because it can be a little intimidating. You know, getting your supply list together. It really, it, uh, you know, if you try to do it quickly, it, it can be very difficult. One of the ones that I find is, is the most difficult is the water and even food, but water, the rule of thumb is a gallon per person per day. So if you're looking at say five to seven days, that's a heck of a lot of water. You know, how are you gonna carry that around if you're gonna go to a hotel or, or, or a friend's house or whatever? If you're going to a friend's or family, they, 
you know, they may already have water available, but you know, they may lose power as well. Don't forget about those prescriptions as well. And, and having batteries, most people think about that. Full tank of gas, if you wait until the last minute, gas stations are likely to close or run out of gas, both. Um, and having cash on hand since electricity will be down. And if anything is open, they probably can only take cash if you're trying to buy something. Next slide. So now uh, this one probably a lot of people don't really do a lot of thought on is thinking about your insurance and uh, flooding is not covered in most that I know of standard insurances for your home. You have to get a separate flood policy that uh, is, I recommend everyone around here get it unless you're sitting on the top of a mountain, you know, you have the potential to flood. So make sure you know that and also that you're keeping these in a safe place and maybe even a quick thing that you can grab with you and take where you're going. When I was uh, evacuating, well, I, I have to work, but I was evacuating my family. I have a little, like one of those fire safes, plastic bags and stuff in it. And I just took that whole thing and I took it with me. So that might be an easy way to do that. And uh, what is your deductible for wind? Is it 2%, 4% higher? You know, that if your house gets destroyed or heavily damaged, you know, the deductible could be uh, more money than you know or are aware of. So be prepared for that as well. Look into that, talk to your insurance agent. Strengthening your home, probably a lot of people know about this, but do you do it? And it's not easy. If you uh, are going out and getting boards for your house from scratch and measuring all that and putting it up, it takes a lot of work, a lot of energy, a lot of time. So prepare for that. If you have shutters or other things, you know, those are not necessarily easy either. You need extra time and energy to do that, but it's if you can do it, and don't forget about those doors, you know, your front doors and back doors and sliding doors. If you have coverings for those, you know, that's good too. Next slide. And then kind of all bringing it all together, you know, having some sort of written plan, which is, you know, kind of list of all the things you're going to do, your contacts, where you might go, who, who do you need to be in touch with, and keeping all that together for quick access. Next plan, or next slide. All right, thanks, Ron. Um, we're about at eight o'clock. We're going to wrap it up here uh, with just a few more slides about staying informed. Obviously, like Ron mentioned, um, our tropical webpage is a great resource for you. Uh, just go there. There's a tropical little hurricane icon on our, our homepage there, and you can click on that. That takes you to the tropical page, and you can get our latest briefing there. You can get the hurricane guide, which um, we had also attached to the handouts um, on this presentation. Um, but then you can also just go through those different tabs. You can look at the outlook information. You can look at those threats and impact uh, graphics if, if they're being uh, produced and available. Um, satellite radar, social media, preparedness, and, and additional uh, links there. So the Tropical page really has, has a lot, um, pretty much all the information you need. Um, but another page is the, our briefing page, and that's that's another good one-stop shop briefing page uh, with a lot of different information as far as precipitation, if you're worried about rainfall amounts or uh, flooding potential, all different types of uh, things. And you can really, you know, that's useful throughout the year um, as well. So that's a good resource. Um, of course, we're on social media, Twitter, Facebook. Um, our little handle is at NWS Charleston SC. The Hurricane Center is at NHC underscore Atlantic. So you can get, um, follow us, follow them, um, you know, get the information right from the, from the source. Um, you know, we also have a YouTube channel, which again, I hope to post this uh, presentation on after, but we also have a lot of videos there, educational type information. Um, for you as well. So whenever you get a chance, you can take a look at that. Um, another way to stay informed, uh, if you have a mobile uh, mobile device, you can, um, most most of those will um, carry the wire, wireless emergency alerts. So for a hurricane, uh, extreme wind, storm surge, tornado, or flash flood warning, those are all a highlight there. And there's certain ones that you can select on or off, but 
Um, that's another great way to, to stay informed uh, during emergencies. And then there's the old trusty uh, no weather radio. Um, and these are really good, obviously, if the, the power goes out, um, you can set them for your uh, particular county, um, you know, for your particular area, uh, for certain types of warnings. So um, those are a good trusty source uh, resource as well. So to wrap it up and finally conclude here, um, you know, with some main takeaways, really we, we want to stress that you should prepare every year for every storm, no matter, you know, what happened last year, what the seasonal forecasts are saying, you know, how many storms may or may not happen. Uh, we want to remind everybody that it only takes one storm in your area um, to be a big deal. So. Don't get too hung up on, you know, what the seasonal forecasts are. And then, you know, also, you know, you want to consider your personal experience, but you don't want to put um, all the stock into your personal experience because every storm is is pretty unique and, uh, you know, can carry different impacts um, with it. So cause different impacts. So the other uh, main point here is, you know, look for reputable sources of information. So that includes us at the Weather Service, the Hurricane Center. Um, listen to those local and state officials like Neil um, at the county level and the state level. And then also local media as they typically will, um, you know, are a great voice uh, for our information. And then um, again, don't focus just on the storm category. You know the strength. If it's a, if it's you know if it's not a hurricane, you know you should take it lightly. Hopefully, we showed you a few examples of why it's important to you know take every storm seriously, and 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 even you know a lot of weaker storms can still pose a significant risk, especially when it comes to the water. So um, you know respect every storm, and remember that flooding uh, ultimately causes most of the deaths. You know, whether it be from storm surge or more recently from heavy rainfall. So with that, um, we wanted to wrap it up and wish everybody a, a happy rest, a safe rest of the season. Um, certainly again, thanks for joining us tonight. And um, we will open it up for any questions. Let me uh, jump back on. If Neil and Ron are still around, hopefully they can jump on as well. Um, I was looking through and I didn't see any questions pop up in the um, in the questions box at this point, um, but I will try to unmute everyone. And if anybody has any any questions here, um, remember that you'll have to unmute yourselves as well, I believe. So let me try to unmute and see if anyone has any questions. All right, hopefully that worked. Does, does anybody out there have any questions for any of us? Hello, do you hear me? Yes, we do. Hey, how are you tonight? Oh, well, good. Um, this was a great presentation. Thank you. But I, I had asked a question in the chat box. We live over here on Tybee. Uh -huh. And when we get the Charleston National Weather Service information, which we greatly appreciate, what's the best way to make that more specific for our location? Uh, and then I'll, I'll mute so that y'all can answer. Thank you. OK. Yep. Thanks for that question. Um, Ron, do you want to take that? Yeah. So one of the issues with a tropical system is we cover 20 counties across two states. So we can't, it's impossible for us to produce detail for every location, including, you know, Tybee Island, but we are briefing in this case, Chatham emergency management. We're also talking directly to officials on Tybee Island. So, 
they're getting information from us, which they then should be tailoring down to your level, to your you know exact local area. So, you know, I would say a combination of listening to our products and services, but also listening to your local officials at the county and city level at that uh, for that particular situation, and pay attention to what they're saying. Are they telling you to evacuate, for example? You know, that's going to be coming from them and from that level. We're, we're just not going to be able to get every piece of detail for every single location. It's impossible. We do have the ability for people to call us. I mean, you know, talking direct, anybody can call our office. There's a public number. I don't know it right off the top of my head, but um, they can call that number. And also, you know, we're on social media. You could ask questions on there as well. So there's a couple of different ways to do it, but I would definitely recommend li you know, listening to those local officials at the county and city uh, level to give you that detail. Yeah, and I, I saw it in the chat, I just responded to her also, just to point out, um, I mean, hopefully we answered your question. If not, please speak up. But um, if you go to our website for any location across the area at any time, of, you know, not just during hurricanes, but you can enter your, um, you know, location, your city, state, or zip code, um, or click on the map um, that you see on the on our homepage there, and you can get the most detailed forecast for your location through that. Um, so whether it's, you know, like I said, not just during a hurricane, but, you know, all throughout the year, and you can bookmark that and keep that, um, you know, for any time that you might need it. So hopefully we answered your question. Um, if not, uh, feel free to speak back up or maybe um, type it back out in the in the uh, in the chat. Is anybody else have any questions out there? I guess we answered all the questions. Well, uh, any last uh, comments from any of the panelists out there before we wrap things up uh, thanks for the invitation to talk bob and i wish everybody a safe and healthy rest of the hurricane season and remember it it just takes one storm and even though we're actually about it uh normal right now it's we're already at like 14 or so named storms and we're just in the beginning not even the middle of September. We've got two and a half more months to go. So buckle up. Hopefully we'll continue to, to stay out of harm's way here. Thank you everybody for attending. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, I think I see Neil talking. Neil, can you? Can you hear me now? There we go. Okay. There we go. I'll do. Yeah, I I just want to reiterate the um, the personal preparation part that Ron talked about, having a plan and knowing how what you're going to do, where you're going to do it, and when you're going to do it. Uh, that is critical uh, to surviving any of the events. And you know, we're that's the part we push the hardest is have a personal plan for all the possibilities that could face you during the year, not just hurricanes. The rest of it. You just follow the guidance that you get from the local authorities. All right. Sounds good, everybody. Thanks again for joining us. Um, if you if we hadn't gotten to your question, we apologize. But um, given the time right now, we're going to wrap things up. Feel free to reach out to us um, at any time. Uh, we'll try to respond to everybody um, with a copy of the presentation and, and any um questions or answers to any of the questions that we come across. So thanks again and have a great night.